do you have to end your cue on the one chord? Do you have to end your cue on the downbeat of the measure? Well, I mean, technically no, but if you want to vastly improve your chances of getting placed by making the editor's job easier, then you're definitely going to have to work out a solid button. We're going to talk about that and look at a lo-fi hip hop cue on my week 26 vlog check-in. <laughs> What is happening, YouTube? This is Dave Croft. Welcome to my week 26 check-in for my 52 cues, where I am writing at least one cue every week for the entire year and talking about it. If this is your first time here, welcome. I'm so glad you found me, however you found me. If you haven't already, please consider liking and subscribing to this video. It does help composers just like you find the channel and hopefully help them out. I also want to give a special shout out to my Patreon patrons who support Keep This Channel Afloat. We're gonna be talking about the Patreon at the end of the video, including kind of, you know, what's in it for them other than the satisfaction of helping keep the channel going. Uh, if you want to skip over the vlog business, you can check out the, uh, you can check out the timestamps in the description below. But today I am talking all about buttons or endings. And one question I get quite frequently is, do I have to end my button on the one chord? On the tonic, if it's a major key, it's a major chord. If it's a minor key, you're going to end it on a minor chord. And do I have to uh, end on the downbeat of a measure? This is called a, a button, a, an ending that is a, it's, it's kind of like telling the audience when to clap. And, and do you have to? Technically, no. No, you don't have to. However, it is strongly, strongly recommended. And in fact, some libraries actually do require buttons like this. But uh, other than, you know, just, just because the library tells me to do it, I, I want to talk about why we should, uh, as production music composers, and it's all about making the editor's life easy. Because if you can make the editor's life easier, then chances are they're going to keep going back to, or, to your cues. If, if they have a, a giant playlist that's given to them by the music supervisor, and you know they're seeing <clears throat> this is just cue written by Dave, and, and there are a lots of good edit points and a good solid ending that I can edit around, and, and my name kind of keeps showing up, and they know that they have an easy time of it then they're probably going to keep gravitating towards it. However, if, if you've written an ending that uh, maybe doesn't end on the one chord or maybe has some kind of rhythmic kind of, you know, some syncopation, then, um, then that could make the editor's life difficult. Why? Why is that? Why would that make their life difficult? Well, you have to think like an editor approaching a scene. You have a scene that, that is a certain uh, amount of time and at any point in that scene, a, a, a dialogue could take the, the emotion of the scene somewhere else. So they need to transition out of your cue. And chances, not, chances are it's not the exact length cue that, that you wrote. The scene isn't a minute and a half or two minutes. And they need to be able to jump out of that scene immediately. And so they go towards the end of your cue. They look for that button, that final one chord. And if they can snip the end of that, of that, of that cue, then they can attach it somewhere else. And if it's on the downbeat and it's lining up with the waveform and, you know, they're, they're counting measures and, and they're trying to time it up. If, if it's on the downbeat and if it's a one chord, then no matter where they're editing from, then within the interior of your cue, they can immediately resolve the harmonic, rhythmic, and melodic tension of your cue. It's like having a, a portable song ending that they can just chunk on to the end as needed. That is the biggest reason we should end on the one chord. Now, I fought this 
fought it. I don't want to say I fought it, but I resisted it originally. And my, my very first placement that I ever had was uh, during the Masters tournament, during a, 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 a feature story with Jim Nance and, 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 a, and a retired or a retiring golfer. And the, the cue that I wrote is called Sunrise on the Green. And when I first completed it, I, I had in my mind that I wanted it to end on this kind of longing plagal half cadence, essentially an unresolved four chord. It was just going to kind of four chord off in. And, and for me, it was like it, it, it signified the hope of the of the new dawn. Right. This is it's sunrise on the green. Right. So the sun, sun is rising and, and the, the whole day is full of potential. And that was my artist brain telling me, hey, this 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 is what it's communicating. But I, I wasn't thinking like an editor. Because an editor is 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 using this piece and this was for a feature story. So so my music was the only piece. But but the, the, the cue itself the, 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 the piece itself was about 53 minutes or 53 seconds. And I wrote a two minute cue and I, I wasn't thinking like the editor because in my mind, they were just gonna if the forlornly end on the four chord and it would be great. But an editor is thinking, Hey, I, I need to jump to a title card here. And so I, I submitted the cue and it had that unresolved half uh, plagal half cadence ending on the four chord. And the publisher was like, I love it, Dave, love it, but we've got to end on a one chord. And I was like, Meh, that's not, that's not really sexy. So, but okay, you know, this is an American Idol ending, ta-da, you know, and, and I wrote an ending, which, which I, I felt, uh, uh, <laughs> I think a little part of me was being a little sarcastic with it. I was like, fine, you want a one chord? Ah, Ta-da, here is the cheesiest, lushest, tropey one chord, ta-da, that I could give them. And don't you know, that one chord at the end, which was super lush and I thought was, was over the top, don't you know, at the end of the piece, title card, that one chord, fade to black, throw to commercial. And I have no doubt in my mind that if I would have stuck with, stuck to my guns, that the editor, I don't think, I don't think, I don't believe that that cue would have been chosen because that one chord communicated the end of the story. The end of the cue communicated the end of the story. And if you end on a, on, on a chord other than the one chord, other than tonic, then you're telling the cue, and by 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 that by that means the listeners that there's more story to be told with this cue by not ending on the one chord. But when you end on the one chord, you're giving the story an ending. You're giving the scene an ending that the editor can grab. And and I don't mean just like a musical harmonic ending, but you're giving them a sense of closure. So give your cues a sense of closure. End on the one chord and end on the downbeat of the measure. This is something I don't even think about anymore. Like I don't give it any more creative energy of how to creatively, you know, end, end my cue. It's always going to be on the downbeat of the measure. And it's always going to be a one chord, or at least that's what I strive for. Every now and then, then a, a, a cue will dictate differently. And I let the cue drive that. But I, I, I am always initially try to end on a one chord because I need the story of my cue to be over. I need to give it a solid resolution so an editor can grab it and edit as needed. So do you have to? Well, your library might make you, but if they don't, do you have to, have to, have to? Not technically, but if you want to vastly increase your chances of your cue being placed and being used in in, uh, in 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 an editor's hands, then do yourself a favor and end on that one chord on the downbeat with a solid 
button. Now, should that button be held out or nice and short? It's kind of 50 50. I find that a lot of editors like having the held out one chord, you know, ta da, two, three, four, and then release. But uh, sometimes, you know, if like if you're working on a hip hop cue or if you're working with something with a lot of samples or if you're working with a cue that has really short sounds, like everything is super staccato, like like uh, dramedy cues, for example, there are all these pizzicato strings, then it doesn't really contextually make sense to end like on a big one chord when every other string sound has been plucky. So that's kind of 50-50 in my experience, but it's always on the one chord and it's always always on the downbeat of the measure. So with that in mind, let's look at uh, a cue that is called lo-fi high tops. It is a lo-fi hip hop cue uh, written during one of the recent live streams. That is a benefit tour to our Patreon patrons here. They have access to the live stream. Uh, like I said, this is called lo-fi high tops. And before we get started, let's take a listen through and then I'm going to be talking all about it. was lo-fi high tops. Uh, it didn't, it didn't originally uh, start out being a lo-fi hip hop cue. Uh, I was really going for just kind of funky sampled kind of throwback and it just morphed into that. So I thought, let's just, let's just let it be what it is and lean into it. I was using for the drums, I was using a lot of the East West, um, East West uh, Public Enemy uh, sample libraries that they have. And to be honest, I'm completely flaking on the name of that library. Let's actually, let's, let's load it up. And I was using the new Opus engine, which tempo syncs these things and uh, tempo syncs specifically. Yeah, yeah, the Public Enemy. Okay. Um, the, the Public Enemy library of, of drum loops. And... The reason I did that is it was throwback. It was old school, if you will. And it needed to, to sound like sampled drums. So I didn't do a ton, if any, of drum programming. It's all loops dipped into some splice loops. And it's all about layered drum sounds here. So I have this drum loop plus this drum loop. I might have programmed this one. I took some samples and then converted it to a loop because one of the things, if if I'm ever if I'm ever doing like a like an old school hip hop that that needs to sound like '90s West Coast type hip hop, 
then I all, always try to deal in waveforms. I always try to deal in loops because I, I, it forces me to compose a little bit different and it forces me to kind of think more like uh, working with a sampler, you know, an old MPC sampler or whatever. The snare drum loop, and then I have a drum fill every fourth bar with a tambourine loop on top of it. So layer them all together with EQs that make them all kind of fit together. Crash, it's got crash cymbal sound, sounds like a Piatti. I do have a scratch vinyl effect that I did lift from Splice. That I, I, I did a little bit of chopping. I, I really thought about breaking out my turntables because I, I do like turntablism and all that stuff. Because in the uh, in the in the mid two thousands, I really got heavily into turntablism, and, and in fact, that's what kind of turned me on to uh, being an EDM hip hop specifically trip hop, acid jazz, uh, lo-fi, lo even though it wasn't really called that at the time, blending and, and remixing like jazz records and, and soul and funk with hip hop grooves. That's what I did a ton in the mid 2000s, early to mid 2000s, up till I guess 2010, 2011 or so. So I have a turntable and I was like DJing coffee shops and stuff with a Newmark TTX and a laptop. And that laptop, I, I had a keyboard controller, not, not, unlike, not unlike this guy, uh, like an M Audio key station that I had, had programmed to Tractor from, from Native Instruments. So I had a laptop and a deck and I would mix on the laptop using MIDI controllers because with a 25 key keyboard, you had, this was deck A and this was deck B. And so I could nudge and, and rewind and, and do effects and everything on either part of the keyboard. And then I would, I would grab my turntable and did actually like scratching effects, like turntablism, you know, um, Qbert type stuff. So I, I wasn't using the turntable to mix. I was using the turntable kind of as, as a percussive percussion instrument. And I remember... At, early in the early days i got a ton of heat for for rolling in with a laptop <laughs> i did a few like corporate gigs and stuff so it was always kind of a novelty but like the dj's the, the fact that i didn't roll up there with two technics and you know a, a, a whole van full of, of vinyl that that was that was a really big deal at the time of course now DJs, I mean, you you have to have a laptop now. The idea of just just having two turntables is 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 kind of gone away. There's no stigma to the to the to the laptop on a DJ rig. But back in 2004, 2005, that was that was a cardinal sin for sure. So I almost I almost almost dragged those out, but they're like in the back of the closet. I the the vinyl is here. Actually, I think the vinyl is in my storage unit. But the vinyl is is safe. It's not in 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 the closet, but the actual deck itself is in the closet. But I had to be really careful using a sample that wouldn't trigger any kind of content ID system or anything. Um, I do have a vinyl effect, which is just, just there at the bottom, just to make it sound a little bit more lo-fi. I do have a sweep effect. Kind of a reverse thing. A couple of bass layers. And getting into the uh, the Lo-Fi Glow plugin from Native Instruments, I had just upgraded to Complete 13, and that came with this. And I think this is kind of what started pushing it into Lo-Fi territory. And I have another uh, another Lo-Fi bass sound using the modulator icons, again, from Complete 13. Really, I just wanted an excuse to use them, and so... Lo-fi kind of uh, e-piano bell thing, again, 
from this lo-fi glow, looking for an excuse to plug in, use the plugin. I recorded my own guitar with Guitar Rig. And I had kind of listened, listened to some references, listened to some references it's like De La Soul, Diggable Planets, uh, Arrested Development, and that, those, those kind of 90s, 90s uh, kind of positive, positive hip hop artists. With piano, using the Noir plugin. Okay, kind of like a Dr. Dre kind of thing. And then an E piano, so with some keyscape. I had to be really careful here because the E piano could really push it into chill lo-fi territory. And because this was going to be used uh, potentially for uh, sports, that I couldn't, I couldn't have it be like, like mega chill couldn't have it be too chill. So I actually gave them a stem without the E piano involved in it. All right, so we start off just a little drum fill to set it up. And I'm looking every phrase to add interest, to add things. And so my second phrase, I added the lo-fi bass and then added the E piano high part and then added the low E piano. I pull back just half of the drum loop, drop out the uh, lo-fi bass too, build, and then we're going to have our first little drum fill here. This is a kind of a little jazzy drum fill that sits in bar four all by itself underneath the scratch effects. I love doing that. I love pulling energy and then pushing it back. I think that's really effective. So that builds. Then I kind of go into my second breakdown where I drop the bass all together. So it's just going to be guitar and drums here, but I let the bass ring out. So it kind of holds out on one chord. button where I'm holding for one chord, two, three, four, release, and then I go in and edit my audio tail so it doesn't ring on for days, two, three, four, hold, two, and then a slow fade to make that audio tail uh, work and, um, and just kind of decay into nothingness. So that is uh, lo-fi high tops. And this was written for, specifically, for the upcoming, um, got, got a, a last minute call, CBS is starting to crank up their big three coverage. And so this was a cue that was written, hopefully, to get placed on their big three basketball. And we'll see, we'll see if it gets placed. The publisher really, really dug it. I was really worried that it was gonna be too chill. Uh, which is why I gave gave him a version with, with and without the E piano, but he loved it, and I was able to put a second one together. One of the challenges of dealing with drum loops is dealing with the different swing pulses and, and kind of measuring or, or um, managing all of the different the different um, internal shuffle shuffleness of those loops. Is shuffleness a word? Anyways, that is going to do it for me today. Thank you so much for joining me. And again, I want to give a special thank you to my Patreon patrons who use their actual real money to help keep this channel happening. If that's something that you're interested in, you can check out my Patreon link below. Patron 
to be a patron it's just a dollar and not only do you get to help keep the channel going but you also get access to my weekly live streams which this was a part of i wrote this cue live during a recent live stream also if you haven't please consider liking and subscribing it does help composers just like you find find this video and it's hard to believe we're here at the at the halfway point of the year and uh, how has your year been we've just wrapped up week 26 and so it's all downhill from here hopefully you're writing at least one cue uh, would love to hear from you you can leave a comment below or you can um, give me a shout out Twitter or Instagram or whatever but thank you so much for hanging out with me I look forward to seeing you next week for my week 27 check-in until next time 